Welcome to 101 East. I'm Steve Chow. Japan is suffering a stocking crisis, with the number of reported cases growing tenfold in a decade. But the real number of incidents is believed to be much higher, with the growing number leading to murder. Evan Williams traveled across Japan to meet those suffering in silence from stalking. Out of sight and in the shadows, an insidious crime is terrorizing women across Japan. Often it's committed by those closest to them, by men who believe that women belong to them no matter what. Stalking is growing faster in Japan than any other nation, and in many cases, it's deadly. I thought of my wife only as something I owned. I used to see her as my personal property. Hiro is a stalker. When his marriage broke down, he refused to accept that his wife could leave. It was absolutely unforgivable that something I owned would run away from me. I had a very strong anger and a grudge against her. Hiro started stalking her, tracing her phone and watching her relatives' homes in Sendai, where she might be staying. I had memorized all my daughter's and my wife's clothes, so I thought if I look at the laundry outside, I could find out exactly where my wife was. Next, it was about how to get them back. Specifically, I was going to break the window, go in, threaten both of them with a knife, and get them into my car to get them back. And he was prepared to go even further. When my wife told me that she wanted to get a divorce, I wanted to get her back, but I couldn't. So out of desperation, I decided to kill my wife in the court. What a stalker really fears is if my property, my woman, falls for another man. That's what we fear most. I thought I might as well kill her, making her mine forever. Several hours south of Tokyo, I meet a man living with the consequences of a stalking attack. Hiroyuki Onoi takes me to a spot where a stalker used to spy on his sister, Yugiko. He would park the car here and watch the house. Sometimes he would be over on that street, on the other side of the park, watching. There were times when he parked right in front of the house, and he would call and tell her to come out. The stalking was intense, incessant phone calls, emails, and threats. He would be roaming around the house watching, and when Yukako was about to go to work, he'd be waiting on the street. There were silent phone calls, and he would call her mobile and threaten her, saying, I'm going to kill your family, or I'm going to set your house on fire. That kind of threat. Yukiko's family complained to the police, but they say all the police did was make the stalker sign this letter, saying that he would stop. It just made the stalking worse. A few days later, while she was driving to work, Yukiko made a desperate call to a friend, saying the man was chasing her. Her friend told her to call the police but there was no time for that. Then he overtook her in his car and drove head on at her at furious speed. It must have been terrifying. I think her very last words were, 
Help me. The man drove straight at her, killing her instantly, then stabbed himself to death. It's left Hiroyuki wishing he'd done more to pressure the police to end the stalking. The first thing that comes to mind is that I'm so sorry that I could not save her. I failed my father too. I told him I would look after her, but I could not save her. Yukiko's murder sparked outrage and led to the introduction of an anti-stalking law, but that was 15 years ago and it's had little effect. Japan has one of the world's worst gender equality ratings and one in three women here has suffered from domestic violence. Last year, police received a record 20,000 reports of stalking, a tenfold increase in a decade and many believe the real figure is much higher. It's very difficult to find a woman who'll speak to us about being a victim of stalking. It's seen as a very private matter. People are afraid, and in some cases, it's even seen as shameful. But there is one woman who'll speak openly to us about the terrifying experience of being stalked. Akiko Kobiakawa was running a successful antique import business when she began dating a man she met through work. When she broke it off, he started stalking her. He forced his way into my office and went violently out of control. He broke things and badly injured one of my employees. What was going through your mind when this was happening? I was constantly frightened. I thought I could never be happy again. I thought I had to give up happiness. It was very difficult. She says the police told her there was nothing they could do because the man claimed it was a business matter. She had to hire private security to make him stop. With authorities doing so little, Akiko became determined to help other women like her. She set up a therapy service where she gets in contact with stalkers through the victims and tries to convince them to end their stalking. It gives her a unique window into why so many Japanese men stalk. Japanese society is especially male-dominated. The idea that women should obey men remains strong. The idea that you dumped me cannot be forgiven. That kind of pride is very strong among Japanese men. Akiko believes it's this pride that drives many Japanese men's stalking and violent behaviour. She warns stalking is far more widespread than the 20,000 cases reported to police last year. I think it's ten times more than that. And now because of the internet, it's multiplying even further. The cases we have been handling have been growing rapidly over the past few years, and the number of young stalkers in particular is increasing. She says repeated counselling can convince most stalkers to stop, but that 20% cannot see what they're doing is wrong and remain extremely dangerous. Just today, she's received an email from one. I'm a stalker. I was in jail until two years ago, but even after my release, I can't get over my grudge against her. I intend to find her and kill her. Recently, I found her address and phone number. I have doubts, but I want to kill her. I wrote back to him immediately to say, let's meet. I think I will be meeting him soon. I will listen to his feelings. Just by talking, you can reduce the energy to attack. We will talk, and he can let out his anger and nurture the feelings that would help him end his obsession.
Last year, Japan introduced tougher penalties to include a small fine and a possible six-month jail term. Yet the number of stalker murders is escalating and police attitudes to stalking victims are still being questioned. Two recent cases reveal why. Thirty-three-year-old Ri Miyushi received a thousand harassing emails and calls from her ex-boyfriend, forty-year-old Hidetu Kozutsumi, before he stabbed her to death in 2012. Eighteen-year-old high school student Saya Suzuki dreamed of being an actress. She briefly dated Charles Ikenaga, who started stalking her after they broke up. Police had been warned of his stalking, yet he managed to get inside her home, hid in a cupboard, and killed her with a knife. Saya was killed in October 2013, just a few days after Japan's new anti-stalking law was introduced. The problem here is the parents complained of police incompetence. They said they asked the police to protect their daughter, and that protection was not forthcoming. Ikenaga was jailed for 22 years. In court, he said he released intimate photos of Saya on the internet as a way of showing he owned her, even in death. Stalking is a sensitive issue for the authorities here. There are reports police often feel unfairly criticised for failing to stop attacks when they can be difficult to detect before they actually occur. We contacted five different police departments, including the National Police Agency, to comment and none of them would talk to us. Meanwhile, the number of stalking cases continues to grow. 21-year-old Atto was stalked by a stranger who one day appeared at her work. She doesn't want to be identified as she's still afraid. He did not say anything to me, but he would pass by the shop and glare at me. I was really scared. During work breaks, when I went outside, he would pass by me several times. Ato says she didn't go to the police because she didn't think they would do enough to protect her. The most frightening thing was, on my way home in the train, he was in the same carriage. It was sickening. So I changed carriage several times, but he still followed me. Instead of the police, Ato came here to a private security firm called the Police Old Boys. Run by former police officers, their main business is providing security for businessmen threatened by the Yakuza. Investigator Yoshihito Hamada followed Ato's stalker for three months to get all his personal details, then confronted the man. Then I told him he had been stalking. I warned him immediately that if he continued, it would become a police matter. He became furious, and I gave him a warning. He said, what are you? What are you? He grabbed my chest and tried to punch me. He said, I don't know you, and then he spat at me and fled. The police old boys has a sliding scale of fees, starting at a few hundred dollars to solve the case of a moderate stalker. The fee can increase to a few thousand dollars if the stalker is more dangerous. Company founder Hirotaki Morikawa tells me the number of women seeking their help against stalkers has doubled in 10 years. The police used to say that the level of danger had to be high enough, but now there have been repeated stalking incidents involving murder. And that's because of the insufficiency of police communication and lack of immediate response on the part of the police. And these things invited the worst possible scenario. The other problem is the penalty is too light. The perpetrator is out too soon, and then he goes to the next dangerous step. That's why clients come to private security firms to try and make sure that doesn't happen.
days later, we meet up again with Hiro, who'd been stalking his wife and threatening to kill her. He didn't. Instead, he became a Christian and now spends his evenings seeking guidance from the Bible. Eventually, he convinced his wife to return, but their problems didn't end there. In September, my wife and I had another huge fight, and my wife felt she was in danger, and we separated again. My pastor encouraged me to get some counseling or look for ways to fix my violence. He decided to seek help to get his wife and their nine-year-old daughter back again. But he says in most parts of Japan, there's nowhere for men like him to get the help they need. Instead, Hiro has to pay hundreds of dollars a month for a weekly four-hour round trip from his home in Sendai to Tokyo. There are lots of institutions to protect the victims, but for the perpetrators to rehabilitate them. In this city of 1.2 million, there are none at all. I just happened to see the news on a domestic violence murder. I followed the links. I saw an article about NPO STEP. NPO STEP is a non-profit group run by therapist Kayomi Kurihara. She holds group sessions for stalkers. Ms. Kurihara says stalkers like these men believe they own the women they pursue and want to reclaim them. Behind the word reclaim is the feeling that she is mine, and that's why they think they have the right to get her back. In Japan, there is a gender bias. It is a distorted notion of manhood and womanhood. Ms. Kurihara set up her therapy service for men to focus on the cause of the problem because she says so many female victims feel totally let down by how police respond to their complaints. The police response to stalking victims is still generally very poor. The victims come to us and say that police do not take them seriously. They don't do anything for them and only tell the victim and perpetrator to be nice to each other. I hear many cases like that. The western city of Kyoto is known for its ancient temples and beautiful scenery. But it's also home to one of the most important centers of stalker study. We're visiting the city's main university to meet Japan's leading criminal psychologist on the issue. Every year, Ryochi Hiroi deals with dozens of stalkers often referred to him from the courts. But he sees a growing silent crisis. Stalking has become a serious social issue in Japan. Until now, Stalker issues have been seen as quarrels between lovers or spouses, such as harassment that accompany divorce. However, there are more victims of stalkers who get killed, so the Japanese police are trying desperately to find out what to do. A key part of his study has been to investigate the way the police and legal systems in other nations deal with stalking. He insists that locking up the most dangerous stalkers only makes them worse, and is now calling for the urgent adoption of a radical new approach to make clinical therapy a mandatory part of any criminal action. Without it, he says, they will continue to stalk and in some cases kill. The Japanese courts and justice system need to think more about how they can prevent stalkers from reoffending. Therapy and rehabilitation of the stalkers need to be a mandatory part of the justice system as it is in some Western countries. Because the reported number of stalking cases is really just the tip of the iceberg, what we have doesn't solve the problem. 1.2 billion population. Hiro, who's seeking help after stalking his wife, says such rehabilitation programs could help save lives. Not enough. 
The government needs to establish programs and raise awareness through all kinds of media that these programs are available. If this happens, I really believe that there will be more victims and perpetrators who can be saved. If these programs had been in place and people knew about them, I'm sure in many recent cases the stalker would not have had to kill. Hiro has been to about 50 sessions. He says he feels he's 80% cured and is getting close to graduating. My real graduation will be the day when my wife can tell me that I am now okay. I'm not sure when that day will come, but I just have to keep going. Today, the campaign against stalking in Japan has a new celebrity recruit. Ikumi Yashimatsu is the first Japanese woman to win the Miss International beauty pageant. After she won, the most powerful man in Japan's entertainment industry demanded that she sign with him. He wanted a slice of the lucrative contracts her title brought her. One day, he turned up at a TV studio. He grabbed my arm and tried to take me away. Then he said he was my real manager, that my manager wasn't really my manager. When she refused, she says the man, who's been publicly linked to the Yakuza, threatened her and her family and hired this man to stalk her. Ikumi went to the police with 30 pieces of audio and video evidence of the stalking. The police did not respond the way I had expected. And not only did they not protect me, they said, if you want to become famous, why don't you sign with him? I remember thinking that the Japanese police are more inclined to protect the perpetrators rather than the victims. Feeling intimidated and fearing for her life, Ikumi went to the courts seeking a restraining order. It took eight months for them to finally say no. She then held a press conference about the continuous harassment and stalking and the lack of police action. She was overwhelmed by the response from thousands of women across Japan. In the messages that I received, there were many personal stories from women getting stalked just like I was. Everyone was saying, they go to the police, but they don't protect us. No one protects us. You have to protect yourself. And we all feel helpless. But the stalkers won't stop. The girls, the victims, live in fear that they could be murdered at any time. So Ikumi launched Stalker Zero, a campaign seeking to change the law so women can get an immediate restraining order from the courts without having to go to the police first. She's also using her new fame to urge people to break what she calls Japan's culture of silence around violence against women. Hiroyuki Onoi, the man who lost his sister to a stalker 15 years ago, is also seeking faster police action to protect victims. He wants the whole country to realize how dangerous stalking is. At the time, we trusted the police. Everybody thought that, but I didn't know enough, and I have a lot of remorse about that. The strongest feeling I have is that I failed to save my sister. Across Japan, who are victims of stalking, are speaking up, refusing to stay silent. But the violence continues. Just before we finished filming, we heard of a woman found dead in a river just outside Tokyo. The day before, she had sought help on Facebook to deal with a stalker. Many wonder how many more deaths it will take 
for the authorities to act and stop the rising toll of innocent victims.